Hi everybody, this is Joanne with Read Science, Science Goddess on Twitter, and I am joined, of course, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Jeff Schomeyer, sitting in Washington, D.C. Um, I guess we can call this, this episode the Midwest episode because our guest hails from the Midwest. She is sitting in Minnesota right now. I'm in Illinois, but she used to be from Illinois. Anyway, we are here with Nancy Atkinson. Say hi to our guest, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Glad to be with you. Thanks so much for inviting me on. Yeah, and you know, we're so glad to, to have you on because you've written a really um, interesting book that I was uh, really enjoying. So it's called Incredible Stories from Space, a behind the scenes look at the missions changing our view of the cosmos. And I definitely will get to talking about the contents of the book, which missions you cover. Um, but you guys, this is really good if you ever want an overview of what we've got out in the skies right now, the unmanned space missions, and if you want to learn about the people behind the missions. So um, I, I really enjoyed it, actually. Uh, I felt like, oh, I know, you know, so my thing is I know about all these missions, but I don't know all the details. Mm -hmm. So uh, so this is the perfect book to catch, catch you up on that. So. Let me introduce properly, read Nancy's bio so you guys know who she is. I have known about her for years, uh, ever since sort of my, the accessibility of space news has been increasing. So I, her name is on many bylines. She is currently Universe Today's contributing editor. Um, she has worked as the senior editor there and um, she's, um, and, uh, and as a lead writer. She has worked with Astronomy Cast and 365 Days of Astronomy. She's the author of this new book, Incredible Stories from Space. And she is also a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, which I would love to hear more about too. So welcome, Nancy. Thanks so much for having me on, Joanne and Jeff. I'm, I'm happy to be with you. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's great fun, and we enjoyed your book. There have been so many interesting robotic I'm sort of avoiding the word manned, but yeah, interesting. Unmanned, unmanned. <laughs> yeah, robotic, non-human uh, missions, and a lot of them have passed through the news, but they can. It, it's hard to keep them straight. And I want, I want to start with one that, I don't know, struck me as as more incredible. And and I was thinking about all the people we've talked to on Read Science who can give us history of of amazing things that have happened in science in just the last twenty or thirty years. Someplace along the way when you were writing about the Kepler mission, you said less than 30 years ago, astronomers weren't sure of any other planets outside our own system. Less than 30 right. years ago. That was like after I finished graduate school. <laughs> then in another place, you said around the mid 90s, scientists weren't convinced that, echo, that exoplanets were a thing. Yes. And then the first confirmed discovery of an exoplanet came in 1994 using giant telescopes on Earth. And then you pointed out that by 2000, we knew an, an amazing 50 exoplanets existed. And then the pace picked up. And now I want you to astound us with what Kepler did and how many planets we know about. It's just, it's phenomenal. Yeah, the Kepler mission, I think, just really changed the whole landscape of of what we knew about other planets orbiting distant stars, other stars. It, as I said, yeah, it's been a short time period, or as you said, it's been a short time period that we've come to know mm -hmm. all about the possibility of planets orbiting other stars, you know? You it's, quoted uh, oh, uh, Thomas Barclay, who is a mission scientist, a... Pre, uh, uh, yes, he works. Okay, who said, I think everybody was astounded by just how easy it was to find planets in the Kepler data. And you noted that there were 750 candidate planets in the first 43 days that they were looking. Right, I think, yeah, you know, he said that everybody was astounded. I, you know, I know as a journalist and as a, a space fan and follower that I was astounded just every time there was a, a press release coming out from the Kepler team you know, here were oh, a couple hundred or a thousand pl you know, planetary candidates. And just, yeah, it seemed like uh, there was just an abundance of planets out there and we were finding, and Kepler was finding them so easily. And it was looking at just a, a kind of a small spot in the sky. 
really. And and the and the yeah. stars were kind of far away, so it was just really amazing how how easily or how quickly this this incredible spacecraft found these planets. And I thought that was a really interesting point that I was quite aware of, I think, when I started hearing about Kepler. But you uh, quoted here, you're quoting uh, Natalie Battaglia, that Kepler is a statistical mission. And what they're doing is they're not looking at all of the sky and trying to find all the planets out there. They said, let's look at a small piece of sky very closely that appears to have not a lot going on in it and see what we can find. That's where they're looking, right? And where they're finding these astounding numbers of things in a, in a little dark piece of sky that other telescopes look at and say, eh, there's not much going on there. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like when, uh, you know, pollsters do a survey of a small number of people to get a general idea of what the, the entire population is thinking or feeling on a certain topic. Uh, yeah, you look at a, at a small sp spot in the sky and get the kind of general idea of how many planet, how many stars have planets orbiting them. And before Kepler, we had no idea does every star have planets? You know, just a few. Well, now we know that every star has star has at least one planet, and almost all of them uh, that we can find have multiple planets. So that's just incredibly exciting. But we're also finding that the solar systems out there are very different from our own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the most common type of planets out there is one that we don't have in our solar system, or at least that we haven't found yet. Uh, there's a chance that the the a hypothetical planet nine that uh, Mike Brown and his compatriots uh, are, are theorizing is out there might be, but it's a, a planet that's in beside in between the size of Earth and Neptune. So kind of a, mm -hmm. a super Earth is what they call them. Predominantly rocky or more gassy or well, <clears throat> well, early on, <laughs> early on in in uh, in finding planets, of course, the the bigger they are, the easier they are to find. So early on, the planets that we found were primarily uh, gas giant planets because mm -hmm. they're big, and also the ones close to their star are easiest for us to see at this time, with the with the current technology. But um, now they they are finding. I I think it was exciting, and I can't remember what year this was. It was uh, uh, within the first couple of years of of the Kepler mission that they found the first and verified the first true rocky um, planet and uh, or, or rocky Earth sized world. So that was that was the yeah. big excitement. That was kind of their goal, their their main goal of finding an Earth sized rocky planet. It seemed like the the way that they're doing this of looking intently at this small part of space reminded me of the Hubble deep field and ultra deep field things where they they turned the Hubble to a, an empty part of space so called empty yes. and collected light for weeks mm -hmm. all together and and there's just well yeah it's it's hard to keep saying astounding but it's like there's just way more galaxies let alone stars than than we ever could have imagined, I think. Right. Yeah. That. Uh, you know. I also read about the the Hubble mission too, and that is truly the the Hubble deep fields and ultra deep fields are, I think, um, my favorite at least. And and whether you can whether people want to say that's the most astounding thing that Hubble has found is just staring at what they thought was an empty piece of sky, the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Mm -hmm. And it's just full of galaxies, galaxies beyond galaxies beyond galaxies, and it's just, just uh, you know, mind blowing is the word that I, I think of. This this is a bit tangential before we get to before I let Joanne say anything, but there's an important point here about about NASA and all of these missions, which is if you want if people want to see and haven't seen the Hubble Deep Field, they can find it on the internet. If they want to find Kepler data or Cassini data or any of these other mission data, they can find it readily on the internet because I don't think there's any agency as committed to sharing discovery and excitement with the public as NASA is. And so, yeah, I would agree. And they've, and uh, especially in the past few years, they've gotten so good at their social media 
that, um, you know, and they're inviting uh, the general public to participate in these, uh, they used to call them tweet ups, but now they're NASA socials, where they actually invite the general public to attend launches or to attend press conferences and actually be, you know, it's not just the journalists anymore that, that have the access like this. And so I think it's it's so great because they, you know, they're they're retweeting the general public's take on on, you know, a launch or a, or a press conference or you know that kind of thing. And they have Kepler particularly has had uh, citizen science opportunities, right, with looking at things and helping to identify candidates for further exploration by the mission scientists and the project scientists, right? Right, yeah, there, um, some of the Kepler data has been made available through the Zooniverse, um, uh, universe of, of all mm. these different citizen science projects, but a lot of the missions actually have uh, a citizen science component, and that too really involves the general public. You know, you don't have to be uh, have a have a PhD to actually make huge contributions to some of these NASA missions, which is so exciting, especially you know all of us uh, nerds that hang out online. It's just like you know we can actually make contributions to a to a NASA mission. That's that's really exciting. Well, it, and you know it is it is absolutely fascinating. I remember many years ago, maybe less than ten, but there was a fourteen year old girl who managed to make. A, you know, a significant discovery. I can't even remember what it is, but I remember it was big news. Like, here's this 14 year old girl. And like, so space is inherently fascinating to people. I think the space and the weather, you know, there's something really, really interesting about these two topics that, you know, non, non scientists can really, you know, appreciate and get into and things like that. So, um, what, what is your take on that being, you know, a journalist in the field of space exploration and astronomy? Uh, the public's involvement or the public's interest? The public's interest, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, on, on Universe Today, the, the primary write website that I write for, and I've had the, the honor and privilege of writing for since 2004, uh, we've had a great interaction with our readers and I, that's part of why I enjoy writing for Universe Today so much is that we've got a you know we've had a great um, comment section and people commenting on articles and a great discussion. They, there used to be a, a forum, the Bad Astronomy Universe Today forum, that you know people would just have these great discussions about the science and you know these, these people these are people that actually go back after they read our article, they'll go and read the science paper, you know, that we've been writing about and, you know, really intelligent discussions. So um, uh, maybe on Facebook or YouTube, you have a little less intelligent discussions, but it, still people are uh, excited to discuss the, um, the science and the findings and, and uh, uh, well, the great images that are coming back from missions like Cassini and Juno and involved the public is in actually processing some of these images it has been really fun to follow lately especially the, the Cassini images and, and the Juno mission to Jupiter actually their camera uh, is completely accessible to the public uh, to process their images um, when I was doing the interview uh, interviews um, for for the book on this mission on Juno they were telling me, yeah, you know, when we put our mission plan together, all of the the data that we wanted to get didn't really include a an optical, you know, visible light camera. But they thought, mm -hmm. well, we're going to Jupiter. We should really bring a camera along. So they decided to make it a completely um, public camera. You know, the um, members of the public can choose what images they want to take or where they want to take pictures on Jupiter. And then all of the processing is done by citizen scientists who just have this love of taking the, the raw data that's coming in. NASA makes it available as soon as it gets to Earth and people jump on this data and process it. And oh, it's the images have been absolutely incredible. That's amazing. I remember uh, there's a famous story about uh, one of the missions, I should know one of the rover missions to Mars that Carl Sagan was involved with, and it, there wasn't going to be a camera. 
And he sort of said, well, wait a minute, if there was something interesting there, wouldn't we want a picture of it? Right. Yeah, the same thing with like, uh, uh, was it, you know, one of the first man missions, like John Glenn insisted that he should bring a camera along on his, you know, first orbital mission of, of the Earth. And they first they were like, well, we don't know, you know, it's if that's that's a good idea but it's like no we need to share this right. and I think that, that's I think like all these images really engage the public and actually I wanted to talk about images in your book now I know for a fact I mean there's color images and uh, you know uh, of course these beautiful images from you know we've got pictures of people we got pictures from the missions and um, so this this is put on very high quality paper it's very nice so um, but the good, you know, what I know about photos and books is they can often be very expensive, but thanks to NASA and everything sort of free to the public, right? This really brings down the costs, right? Yeah, for, right. For yeah, that's, like. that's what I was uh, in, in negotiations with the publisher. I was saying, well, we, we need to include a lot of pictures because, um, you know, that's that those pictures really tell the story of what these missions are doing and finding. And uh, they said, well, you know, how, how can we do that? I said, well, all of NASA's images are freely available. You know, they're, they're uh, uh, public domain. So that's, you know, that was wonderful. And I was able to uh, include over 240 images in the book. And that was it was fun to be able to to pick that many images. I mean, it was hard to actually limit it to, to, the, to that many because there's so many great images from the different spacecraft out there. Yeah, it, it's really amazing. And, and I do want to, to let people know, actually, as nice as this book is, this, this comes out really, really nice in the electronic book version, too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad you enjoyed that uh, electronically as well. But yeah, I have um, I was really pleased with the the quality of the paper that the publisher used, and and the they did a really good job of making sure that the color was uh, col color came out really well. Yeah. Oh no, that's definitely true. I yeah, I really really enjoyed these. So teachers hopefully know this by now, but anybody, you know, you can go to NASA and get all sorts of resources, including these beautiful images and data, and uh, they have their extension for education, right? So. Yes, so, right. Yeah, um, so a lot of a lot of great resources for teachers and anybody interested in space exploration. Just go to NASA's website and and there. you can find them all. But w what I like about having a book like this is that you know everything is told in one place because sometimes NASA's website it's it's big and you'll be redirected here and there. So this is great because if you're interested in these missions, so. Um, if everyone will humor me. I just want to read your table of contents. And then I want to know how did you choose what order to put them in, okay? So let me read this. So <laughs> we've got we've got an introduction, um, but we'll start here. So she starts with Unlocking Pluto's Secrets, New Horizons. That's Alan Stern's project. Uh, that was so exciting a couple years ago. Roving Mars with Curiosity, which of course you bring up other rovers. Can't just talk about one without the others. Uh, Changing Everything, the Remarkable Hubble Space Telescope. Of course, that was incredible. Traveling Between Two Worlds, Dawn. Frankly, I will tell you this one I didn't know that much about, so I was happy to read about it. Um, Hunting for Planets, Kepler and the Search for Other Worlds, which is, of course, we're looking for exoplanets in addition to everything else. Uh, unveiling Secrets of a Ringed World and Its Icy Moons. Cassini Huygens now, is, unless I should say that differently. <laughs> I say Huygens. Okay. Huygens, 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 is it right? Huygens, okay. Huygens is how I, I uh, pronounce it. Then you were probably right. Um, downloading the Sun 24-7, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which I've always had a fascination with. Uh, rising to the occasion, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and High Rise. And um, shooting the Moon, the Lunar Reconnaiss Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, and then you uh, talk about some missions and discoveries to watch and of course ask the important question of why we should explore space. So my first question, this is so for the benefit of people watching, this is what's in the book. Um, so how did you choose the order? Oh, the order, um, I guess I chose to do the New Horizons mission first because that, when I started writing the book, that 
mission at just like about six months before that was when they did the flyby of Pluto. So that one was kind of fresh on my mind and I, it was all the data that was just coming back from the mission and from the flyby of, of the Pluto, Pluto system. And so it was just kind of like, that was the most exciting. I kind of wanted to start off with a bang. And uh, of course, um, speaking of starting off with a bang, Alan Stern is just a wonderful person to talk to, a, a dynamic personality. He's, you know, just a wonderful, I've, I've had the great um, pleasure of being able to interview him throughout the mission. I interviewed him um, back in, you know, January of, of 2006, just months before the spacecraft launched, and we talked about the mission, and I interviewed him throughout the, the nine and a half year flight to Pluto, and and uh, and then had the chance to talk with him after the mission as well, after the, well, I shouldn't say after the mission, the mission is still it's ongoing, still going. but after yeah, after the Pluto flyby. And um, yeah, so that was how I chose that one. Another, as far as the rest of the order, I don't know, it just kind of uh, fell into place, I guess, of, you, I tried to, it's like all of them, uh, all of these missions, you know, got to hold a special place in my heart because I uh, got to know the missions really well and I got to talk to so many of the people behind the missions. And so it's like each of these missions are kind of uh, very special to me. So um, their order in the book is by no means uh, the order of you know, the importance or or anything like that. It's just, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I was, like, uh, I was sitting I, before, is it launch dates? Yeah. Is it what? <laughs> so I figured you might have had a reason and they're all interesting. So definitely there is nothing to the order as far as importance or interest or anything like that. Yeah, right. And it was just, um, yeah, I, I um, in writing the book, I, uh, the, the, the big challenge in writing the book was a, an extremely short timeline of doing my interviews and having the first draft ready. I only had about um, four and a half months. So, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but so you have was, the context, so it's not right. like you're hunting who should I interview, right? Yeah, all of the, the media relations people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and John Hopkins University and uh, <laughs> uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, they were wonderful. I just, you know, contact them and say, um, I'm writing a book on these missions and I would like to talk to uh, a couple scientists and a couple of engineers for each of the mission. Uh, so, like, you know, this was in December and in January, I, the second week of January, I flew out to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They had three solid days of interviews lined up for me and in, in, interspersed between the interviews, I got to go like to the Mars yard out there, which is like their practice field that they have these engineering uh, versions of their rovers out there and they can practice tra you know, traversing across sand dunes or over rocks and that kind of thing. I uh, got to see all the different, uh, you know, the rooms that you see, the mission control rooms that you see on, if you remember when the Curiosity rover landed, there's, the, you know, all these people in blue shirts, you know, ma monitoring these consoles. So I got to tour that room and, and uh, see lots of all these places that I had, uh, uh, you know, seen on, on NASA TV and all that, that sort of thing. So it was, it was fun to be there, fun to have the opportunity to meet these people face to face and and talk to them about their missions and uh, yeah so I interviewed um, 37 NASA scientists and engineers yeah. for the book that's good and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know every interview was just such so much fun and such a joy they were very excited to share their stories of what it's like to work on these missions and how they came to be scientists and engineers what inspired them and just uh, it was it was really fun. I, I enjoyed the interviews a, a lot, uh, and then sitting down to to write it. That's the hard part, but uh, it was it was fun. It was fun to do. You you talked about it some in the book, and here you're talking about talking with these people. And one thing that that is true about people who work on these NASA missions is that they are really into it. Oh yeah. 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 Not, none of them are are really just. Yeah. You know, Nobody like, phones it in. They are there, right? They are doing it because they they've got that space fever, and they want to do these things and do really good jobs usually. 
Well, and you yeah, have the, to want to, right? Because these the, missions the take commitment. a long time from inception yep. to, to launch to, yeah. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? Oh, well, sure. Yeah, that's yep. uh, that's ex exactly right. They're, they're probably the biggest space nerds and you know they're they're all fans of explore exploration and and of space and of NASA and so they're you know they know that they have these very unique and unusual jobs and and a lot of them know that uh, know this and they and they're very good about sharing you know some a lot of them have Twitter accounts and they're and they're kind of sharing things mm -hmm. like um, in particular yeah. Carrie Bean who works with the Dawn mission and she also now works with the with some of the rover missions as well and she's very good about kind of talking about what she does or what happened during the day on Twitter and and it's fun to follow her and and uh, yeah it's um, it they were all wonderful people to talk with and and I and I not only got to talk to like you know Alan Stern, who's the the principal investigator of the New Horizons missions. I got to talk to a lot of the principal investigators. But what was really fun was to talk to kind of some of the behind the scenes people. I talked to a large group of people from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission, and, and in particular the high rise camera, and what it's like to, you know, yeah, you're working behind the scenes to figure out. Um, you know, how do you send the commands or for, formulate the commands to send to a spacecraft to take mm -hmm. a particular picture of a s small little spot on Mars at a certain time under certain lighting conditions using certain filters? You know, how do you program a spacecraft to do that that's traveling at high speeds around a planet and to take these absolutely stunning pictures of of Mars and other and other worlds out there? Uh, it's it's to me that's incredible. Most of those those people, the engineers that I've known, and that I want to move, have a, a similar topic that we've talked about. But even the ones behind the scenes, the guys doing the thermal analysis, the guy writing the algorithm for the camera, the 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 woman doing this checkout over here, they've got they've got that keen interest in space and exploration. But all the times I've seen, at least with successful missions. The mission also appreciates those people. They let them know that what you are doing is critical to making this mission happen. And so there's a whole there's a whole management thing that it's hard to get a feel for, but where where people's work is appreciated and they're doing it because they really want to. There's a lot of enthusiasm. Oh yeah, uh, I you talking about that reminded me of uh, the interview I did with. Um, Earl Mays, who's the project manager for the Cassini mission, mm -hmm. and you know that mission has launched. Um, let's see, when did it launch? 1999, I believe, and it got to Saturn in 2004. So, you know, so that mission has been going on for a while, and it's it's going to be ending this year, sadly. That's right. But but Earl was talking about kind of the whole cadre of of scientists that they've had over the course of the mission. He said, you know, we've we've brought on some some younger scientists to to kind of work in the shadow of the older scientists and they've learned the ropes and have gone on to to conquer other worlds as as he said you know to to go and work on other missions and you know both her him and and Linda Spilker who's the who's the lead scientist for the mission they just talked about the importance of the team of scientists that have worked together from around the world Mm -hmm. um, on this on this mission, you know, it, that's kind of the thing. With an, even though they're classified as NASA missions, a lot of there's a, so much international cooperation on these missions, which I think is a can be a model for uh, for uh, you know political uh, cooperation. Yeah. You know, yeah. it 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 would I think uh, uh, people could look at uh, what's going on in space missions as far as uh, how people could learn to cooperate better yeah. around the world. And then also for people who who don't know much, but there, there are lots of good things to know about NASA culture. I worked on um, a, a microgravity experiment that flew twice on the space shuttle in 94 and 96. And I started working on that when it was a laboratory idea 10 years before that. And we noted during the project that, you know, along the way before something launches or even after you've launched and done mission operations, there are hundreds of people who get involved and you get to know all of them. And it takes a long enough time that 
people get married, some people die, we've had that happen, yeah. a few babies were born. And so I thought it should have been, you know, a flashing lights, but you wrote, getting a robotic spacecraft or a mission to space is no easy task. I want to, I want to hear more about that. I want people to understand that, yes, it, it takes a long time and, and people want to try to do it in a shorter time, but I don't know yeah, whether just, we can get there from here yet. Right, just kind of the way uh, NASA chooses missions and the um, what they, they have announcements of opportunity uh, where specific types of missions are are being looked at and and you know they'll encourage people to propose. So yeah, it can from in a very open process. Right, right, exactly. So there can be I'm you know there are pro for every mission that goes to space there are probably 10 other ones that are just as exciting and interesting that don't make the cut and you know and it's just a factor of of uh, funding and and availability and and launch launch windows and all that kind of thing but um yeah it's it's a long process of of when you come up with the idea you know there's probably some outstanding science question or some mystery that that people want to answer and they come up with mm -hmm. a uh, you know, an instrument or, uh, you know, a spacecraft with multiple instruments to, to kind of solve this mystery or answer their questions. And seem, so they... I'm sorry, it can seem sort of trivial or arbitrary sometimes to say, oh, the, here's this mission which is going over to here and they're going to uh, drill and look at these rocks and then they're going to do this uh, spectrophotometry here. And people go, why are they doing that instead of... But what's behind that is probably 10 years of continual peer review, engineering review, people to decide, yes, this probably will give us the biggest payoff in science for something we can do, but we can learn something from putting this instrument on there too, and so it can advance the state of the That's part of the process. A lot goes into choosing to do these specific things in order to try to maximize what we learn, right? Yeah, exactly. And they've all, all of the different instruments kind of even though they're they're doing separate observations, a lot of times they have to work together as far as you know figuring out the timing. If you if you're if all the instruments are kind of bolted on to the uh, spacecraft, like most of them are now, a lot you know the Voyager had kind of uh, um, cameras that could slew from side to side, but um, that just got to be really expensive. So it's it's more cost effective to just bolt your instruments on. Well, then you have to turn your spacecraft so that this camera can observe this spot over here. And in the meantime, the, the other instruments are over here and can't do any observing. So you, they've had to learn how to kind of slice and dice their, their mission profile of getting everybody the opportunity to use their instruments at, at the optimal time. So it's a that's another kind of cooperation thing that a lot of people could learn from of, of, you know, you've got a limited time. A lot of these missions have a limited time of when mm -hmm. they're operational or when they're doing their flyby or when they're doing their mission. And so you've got to you know, optimize every minute of these, mm -hmm. um, of when these spacecraft are available. The, the, because, the mission planners are very adept at doing that. And I yes. think you told, you told some really interesting stories. I think it was with Cassini about yes. coordinating uh, all yeah. sorts of diverting things and the scientists all working together and, and you don't want to do certain things because it might have a higher probability of damaging a sensor. We'll do it, but we'll do it after we've done these other things. Right. And I liked, um, I, I was actually, I, I was not aware of this, the story of the Cassini Huygens, where uh, they were not able to communicate because yeah. they were going yeah. at the, the different speeds and that, you know, created an issue. But yeah, then they, I, they figured out how to work that out. Right, exactly. And I had, um, I had, you know, knew there there was this kind of problem with the the Huygens spacecraft, which was a piggyback mission that went along with the Cassini spacecraft. And the idea was Huygens was going to land on Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. And um, yeah, there was a problem with uh, the communication rate. And so they they were doing a, a flyby of Earth to get a gravity assist to 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 make it out to Saturn, and so they decided to do a, a test. And so they kind of simulated a test of the Huygens probe, you know, making its descent down to to um, Titan, and they didn't get any of the data, and or what and 
anything that they got was garbled. And it took them several months to figure out what the problem was. And at first they just kind of said, you know, we, we're not going to have a mission. This isn't going to work because you can t if you can't send back your data, it doesn't matter how much data you've gathered if you can't, you know, relay it back to Earth. And so, well, they figured out the problem was, uh, was in the communication between um, uh, the Huygens spacecraft and the Cassini spacecraft, which was going to act as a relay. Um, because Huygens was a, a smaller spacecraft, didn't have the ability to, to transmit directly to Earth. So uh, after some very uh, high-powered uh, engineering, uh, you know, tests, they figured out that all they needed to do was to change the way that Cassini was flying away from from the Huygens probe. Mm -hmm. It's like um, just using kind of a different frequency in, in able to, to make the communications. So yeah, you know, you're doing this, you're figuring out how to fix a spacecraft from you know, millions of miles away and, and they did it and it was a, a great success. That's, yeah, that's a great story that, I, that was fun to tell. With some right, amazing a, feats, yeah. yeah I think there's a lot of tension in these stories. Oh yeah. Was, is it going to land, like the famous curiosity yeah. situation, is it going to land safely, will, you know, or will we have launched something and it's not going to work? And of course, Hubble, you know, which requires yeah. people and not just software mm -hmm. uh, tweaks, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, I, Hubble's a great uh, example of, you know, a lot of people say, you know, is it human humans versus robots? Well, Hubble is a great example of humans and robots working together and learning how to, to fix problems and problem solve and, and uh, you know, team efforts. It's, it's all great, great examples of, of how the rest of us could uh, cooperate together. I, I was looking at this, is, this is, a, I think, a new topic, but you noted that, that Cassini lasted for 13 years around Saturn. And I know from, from the bit that I did with NASA, but all of these robotic missions usually have what's called their design lifetime, which people may not understand the implications. And it's usually something like 18 months yep. or, or something that you know matches uh, the critical thing. And then there are extensions. And really, things tend to be designed for longer than that anyway, kind of. And sometimes they go along very long. And then I wanted to tie that in with, I thought the very interesting observation when you were talking about the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and I think the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is another example of how people at NASA are starting to design long-term missions intentionally to last for 10 or 15 years because that's the sort of time scale they need, but it, it makes sense. How did, how did we finally get from these, you know, six month missions that turn out to last five years to something that's actually designed to last for 15 years? Well, probably the big thing is just the advancements in technology and computing power and those kind of things. You know, the, the, uh, the first Mars rover, the Pathfinder rover was projected to last like, you know, maybe two weeks, but it did last about uh, several months. So that was, that was exciting. And of course the, the, uh, the Mars rover's curio uh, opportunity and spirit, mm -hmm. the design lifetime of about three months. Well, opportunity still going. Uh, what are we? Eleven years into the mission now. So Something yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I think you know NASA builds these very robust spacecraft, but they're also very cautious. I don't think they want to say, "Oh, this is going to last a long time," and then it lasts two months. Um, they they like to. Um, uh, Underestimate and over deliver, I think, is what they like to do, and and that's that's uh, they've done that a lot. Uh, you know, missions like Cassini uh, that have gone for so long, or the or the Mars rovers, and we can hope that the Curiosity rover lasts a long time as well. But even like the Voyagers, you know, we're still getting pings yeah. from them uh, every week, and we know where they are, and they've even able to make discoveries about the outer part of our solar system because of their distance and how far they are away and and sending back the the limited data that they can take right now but still we're making discoveries and so that's exciting and speaking of uh, the furthering missions that there was originally of course the plan for the New Horizons to continue past Pluto 
but they've actually announced last night, like, this is what we're doing next. Yeah. And what, what do you know about that? Because you'll know more than I do. <laughs> yeah, well, they actually announced, uh, like, shortly after the flyby that, um, well, and NASA's real cautious about um, announcing that mission extensions because you know you have to take the costs into into mind and and ho you know hoping that the spacecraft survives the, the Pluto flyby but um, shortly after the Pluto flyby they announced that they were actually going to go or NASA announced a mission extension that they could go and observe another Kuiper belt object mm -hmm. uh, a, a very different type of object you know Pluto is kind of a bright icy object and they had um, discovered an, another object. Um, it's got a very bland name of, uh, I think it's hey. 2000, 2014 MU69. <laughs> yeah, it's something, I, I think I retweeted it, so I should go take a look yeah. at it. Yeah, um, so it's, but anyway, um, so they've known that they're going to be uh, heading towards this other object, a, a very different object, it's a, it's a dark, darker object, a Kuiper belt object, something that we've never had the chance to look at close up. And, uh, but now last night they announced, they've been doing some observations with it, kind of, um, they used the Sophia uh, airborne space, uh, you know, um, not spacecraft, but aircraft to make observations and also just some ground-based observations. There's been some occultations of this object where it goes behind uh, um, another star or or I guess goes in front of a, another star, and you can kind of get some information about the object as it kind of goes in and out um, in front of another object. And uh, there's now the possibility that this is a, uh, a binary system. So it's like two objects yeah. instead of just one, which, you know, two is better than one. So it's exciting. Right, yeah, I could see that's the artist rendering. Yeah, looks like yeah. Uh, they, you know, they're so close together, but then they're maybe they can be discerned to be two things. So. Yeah, I mean, we've we found uh, that a lot of asteroids are binary asteroids, where two are kind of orbiting each other around a, a common center of gravity, and you know, uh, finding a, a Kuiper belt object like this, it's, that's I, it might be the the first Kuiper belt object that we've known of that is a binary system. So, uh, and that the spacecraft is going to be going and and. Uh, observing this one close up is pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. It's amazing that you know, and it's good to see a, a mission extended like that to get more, right. and more information. So. Yeah, um, you know, back to to Jeff's comment about building robust spacecraft. So I was uh, interviewed Alice Bowman, who's the um, kind of the mission operations manager of the of the New Horizons mission that flew past Pluto and not, now out to this this other object. And they're hoping that the mission could go into the 2030s. They've got mm. a, uh, uh, a a nuclear power source, the RTGs, the, I can't remember what that stands for, but anyway, it's a nuclear power source. And so, okay. um, uh, yeah, they're hoping that it can last that long. And if they get mission extensions, then they could go observe other objects as well. So yeah, we could learn a lot about the Kuiper belt f just from this one spacecraft. Right, and I think one thing we get, I'll, I'll let you speak next, Jeff, really quick. No, it's okay. is what, when I looked at, when I looked at, uh, you know, reading through all these things, everything depended on different uh, propulsion, different power sources, different, you know, all of these considerations. And I thought it was interesting, the wide variety of things, you know, that, that NASA scientists are trying to do um, that that work well for their mission, right? Right. Like, so iron propulsion's working better for Dawn, mm -hmm. right? And then different kinds of propulsion work better. You know, to where do we have to go? What do we have to do? Right. Very yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it was fascinating to talk about the different uh, systems. You know, ion propulsion. It's just such a great. Um, kind of a melding of science and science fiction because mm -hmm. sci it's, you know, ion propulsion, we've heard about that in Star Wars and Star Trek and, and mm -hmm. multiple uh, books have, have used ion propulsion in their, you know, sci-fi stories. But here's an actual mission that, that's using this and very robust, you know, the spacecraft has um, was able to go to two different objects and go into orbit around two different objects, the first spacecraft to, be, to do such a thing. And just, uh, you know, making, making science fiction and turning it into science fact. I was evidently reading about 
this mission when I noted on page 94 in my copy of the book, no orbital dynamics drama for achieving orbit around Ceres or Vista. I'm not sure I remember what it was I just read before that. I thought, oh my goodness, all that orbital drama. Oh yeah, well remember as you know Joanne mentioned earlier the the uh, excitement of the Curiosity rover landing. Yeah, you know okay. everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat and wondering if this is going to land correctly and and then when they get the signal that the spacecraft is landed everybody's jumping up and down and hugging and crying and yes. you know and it was kind of a worldwide event that everybody was watching online or at least everybody in my uh, social media circles anyway. But then uh, yeah. You quoted the, someone as saying, no minutes of terror yes. <laughs> relates to that. Yeah, Mark Mark Raymond, who's who's the one of the the lead engineer for the uh, the Dawn mission. Yeah, he said when uh, <laughs> it took several months to, to to get into orbit and to slowly spiral down and yeah, he was out dancing with his wife when uh, when the when it initially went into orbit or in, you know, it wasn't, it's not a, a quick thing. It's, it's a slow thing. So, uh, you know, acceleration with patience is, is, is how he described it. This is versus with the rover landing, what the seven minutes of terror when right. things are happening and, and untried stuff is going on and they don't have communications. And I suppose there's a place for both of them, but I don't, I, I prefer the, the lower drama. Uh, <laughs> Or <laughs> but we will have some excitement, right, when Cassini crash lands onto the surface of Saturn. But then that mm -hmm. delay, that time delay, is even yeah, it's about a, it's a, yeah, it's about a ninety minute delay uh, of uh, when the signal reaches Earth from when it happens, and it'll you know it's going to be all of a sudden we're not going to hear from it. It'll or it might be a gradual thing. You know, it's. It's going to be sad when Cassini uh, crash lands into Saturn, but uh, they're doing it for for a good cause. It's the spacecraft is running out of fuel, even though all, all the instruments seem to be working really well and the spacecraft is is operating really well. It's been a very robust and and problem free mission, um, but they are running out of fuel, and so they won't be able to. Um, you know, guide the spacecraft or tell the spacecraft where to go. And there could be some microbes from Earth still adhering to the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, microbes seem to be very robust and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, they can survive a lot of different things. So they there's some potentially habitable moons around Saturn and they don't want to contaminate them with any uh, microbes or anything like that so mm -hmm. it's it's called planetary protection and and you've probably read in the news lately that NASA is looking for a new planetary protection officer which is uh, oh. a, yeah it's yep. it's it's a great title it would be great on your business card <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah so it, it's a uh, it, it's actually a big part of, of of missions these days is you know how do you make your you know, all these spacecraft are built on Earth, but you need to kind of decontaminate them, but you don't want to wreck your your instruments by, you know, putting them through, well, you know, like blasting them with radiation or something like that to get all the microbes off. So it's it's a fine balance. This might be like our, our Jeopardy lightning round, but as I was reading, I wrote down a couple of of startling facts, and I don't know if there's what there is to say about it, but things like, um, Things that we didn't know that we do now. Six percent of all meteorites on Earth come from Vesta. Right, and how, how surprising is that? That's yeah, yeah what's that's going on with that. You know, that's amazing. And it, and they they all come from a certain spot on Vesta. So the Dawn mission has showed us that there's this huge impact crater on the south pole of Vesta. So it got slammed into by another object, you know, millions of years ago. Right and sent all this debris flying through space. And obviously it was just in the right trajectory that a lot of the meteorites that we have from Earth are from Vesta, and they're all from this South Pole Basin that got slammed into millions of years ago. That observation ties in, doesn't it, with, with something that was in the news in the last couple of weeks about going to visit or, or working with a, another asteroid and some, some comment that, Scientists, some scientists think the asteroid might contain uh, organic molecules. And, and people are like, why would they even say that? It's like, well, 
look at all this stuff that came from Vesta. If organic molecules are common in meteorites, they've been there for a long time, and some of them have gotten to Earth. Right. There may, there may be implications, right? Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, how did life start on Earth? Oh, People yeah. have, have wondered. Yeah. Where was, you know, was organic material brought to Earth from, from comets and asteroids, or did did was what? is that ubiquitous throughout space you know mm -hmm. do we have that type of material everywhere so that maybe another thing that's becoming much more common than we used to think was possible even yes. to find organic molecules they're finding it in interstellar dust uh, amino right. acids and things like that what about those bright spots on series what what is a mystery with those? Do we know anything more about those yet? Yeah, so yeah, there were these bright spots on Ceres, and even before the Dawn mission, there's been hint of those from like Hubble Space Telescope. But as as the Dawn spacecraft got closer and closer to, to Ceres, these kind of bright spots were almost like beacons kind of shining on, yeah. uh, shining from Ceres. And of course, there was all sorts of speculation, you know, lights from alien cities or uh, <laughs> this kind of thing. Well, it turns out it's just um, salts, basically kind of like um, Epsom, soda, Eps right? Epsom baking salt. soda or Epsom, yeah. Epsom salts. Um, so obviously, though, but that's it, it's still exciting because obviously um, yeah. Ceres has a, a wet interior or Used Those at least salts used got to there somehow. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's got water bubbling up on, from the surface, leaving these salts behind, these bright salts, and, and um, you know they're very reflective in sunlight, that kind of thing. So that's kind of why they were kind of shining. Right. But but you know, it's just all exciting and. Uh, it, it, so it's, weird. One, yes. One that I think and I think this was in relation to Kepler, but I'm not sure. But just, in March of 2016 we that's we the people explorers the for the first time ever we saw the shock breakout in a supernova event i i was excited by that um yeah was that kepler no uh, yes yes uh, yes yes it was so now the Ke the kepler mission is not well they still are looking for exoplanets but they had a problem with the spacecraft. So mm -hmm. to, in order to stare at a certain spot in space, you need to have a very stable Steering, spacecraft. Yeah. And so you have these things called reaction wheels, which are basically kind of gyroscopes in, uh, in the spacecraft. And the spacecraft has four of them. And in order for the mission to, to succeed, you need at least three. Mm -hmm. And they lost one, and then they lost another. So they only had two. And, but they still had this great telescope out in space. And so, uh, you know, people came up with this great idea to have a different mission profile. Right. And so they're able to do different things now. They're even able to make observations of, of the planets in our, in our own solar system. Uh, they're looking for things like supernova. And uh, yeah, they, they saw this kind of, as it happened, uh, a supernova going yes. off and yeah. We believe astrophysicists believe they they know, and it's it's a it's a complicated series of events in a supernova. With this happens, then this happens, and this shrinks, and this happens, and these make these atoms. And at one point, there's that thing where this is collapsing so fast it creates a shock wave that comes out, and that was what was seen. And that's hard to catch because it it happens in in parts of a second. That, right, that. you basically have to be looking at something by chance as it happens, yeah. and that's just, and we were. just and what happened. One of my other favorite little stories that we were talking about something earlier was there's a guy named Doug at Ball Aerospace who figured out how to use the solar panels, right, to orient them, to get solar pressure, to use solar pressure to balance and compensate for the one reaction wheel that wasn't working on the Kepler mission. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah it, that was it, a good story. <laughs> yeah, and it's just kind of um, as as the one person that I talked to, um, Wesley Traub, who's a who's head of NASA's exoplanet exploration missions. He said it was just like something that happens in a movie where the the hero comes in and and you know comes up with the MacGyver like solution mm -hmm. at the end and uh, figures out how to make something work, and that's basically what happened. And you know, I've. I've been there like a couple of times, but you know that's the time he says, wait a minute, what if, and everyone's listening, and then there's just silence, and everyone's thinking, yeah, that's obviously, I mean, it's some so of those things just hit you in the face, like, yeah, it's so crazy it, it might it. work, yeah, so crazy it might work, yeah. It's going to work. <laughs>
<laughs> so, so why don't we ask? We have a few minutes left, but I'm I'm curious. One, first of all, to ask, how did you get into this job? How did you end up with the job you love so much? Like, you, you know, what what's your story? Oh, it, yeah. So, um, <laughs> I kind of this is kind of my second career. So I had my kids and uh, stayed home with my kids for a while, but then when they went off to elementary school, um, I kind of rekindled my passion that I had with space exploration since I was a young girl. I, I'm old enough to remember the sitting down with my family and watching the Apollo missions. And I just was always fascinated by um, by that and, and the Voyager missions and ex, you know the, the first missions to explore our solar system. And um, yeah, I just kind of got, <clears throat> you know, like I said, <clears throat> excuse me, rekindled my passion about uh, of space exploration. Um, I was an English major and realized, hey, I could write about this stuff because there doesn't seem to be a lot of people following what's going on in space, all the exciting things that are happening, both you know, human missions, the, the space shuttle program was going on at that time, and and the robotic missions. And so I, uh, I love to write and I uh, uh, love space, so I kind of combined those two. And, um, you know, I was... I worked at a, at the Science Museum of Minnesota for a long time, or for a couple of years, and uh, you know, realized I could uh, to, to, instead of just sharing all this stuff with kids, I could share it with adults too. So that's when I started writing. And then uh, in 2004, Fraser Kane from University had uh, published a little thing online saying, "Hey, I'm looking for some additional writers," and uh, so I, I sent him my resume and he promptly, promptly gave me a great assignment of writing about uh, uh, interviewing a former astronaut about going to Mars. So oh. that, was, that was a fun, fun first article and it's been a great relationship ever since. Wow. wow, wow, that's amazing. So Yeah, so it's, it's, I guess it's basically a story of um, following your passion and, and following your bliss and doing those kind of uh, things that you probably, you know, I, I would have never imagined that I'd be doing this and, and having the opportunity to write a book and to talk with all these amazing people that I get to talk with. Yeah. Right, okay, and to so go, have... go view some, some launches, et cetera, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. I, I do have one more little quotation that, Joanne, I was saving sort of for the end because it seems okay. that sort of thing. You quoted Mark Raymar, who was associated with one of the projects. But I, I loved it when he said, who doesn't long to know the universe? Yeah. Yeah, Mark, Mark Raymond is uh, with the Dawn mission, and he's just a very passionate person, probably the most passionate person I've ever met. He's passionate both about life itself and, and space exploration. And he just, you know, he said, everybody who's ever had these feelings of wanting to go beyond the next horizon to see what's out there, that they're part of this mission and part of NASA's mission as well, mm -hmm. of uh, you know being able to participate and and follow along with these missions so closely that, as we talked about earlier, uh, NASA making that available, uh, making data available readily and and sharing so much of their of their exploration, as it happens with people around the world. Amazing. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wistful, wistful <laughs> imaginings of the universe, right? Yeah, exactly. All <laughs> that kind of Star Trek uh, yes. um, future of of what the future could be like, and yeah, I think I think we're living that now, and you know this this great era of exploration. Right. It's it's incredible. So before before we sign off, <clears throat> was there a question we should have asked you that we didn't, or something you really feel like you need to tell our audience? Um, oh, I guess, so um, writing this book really was not my idea. So I was actually contacted by the publishing company, Page Street Publishing. Uh, they had an idea for the book, uh, for a book about NASA's um, unmanned or robotic missions to space. And and they contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in writing it. So I was extremely honored to, to get that phone call, that kind of phone call out of, the, out, out of left field that you don't expect to get. Yeah. And uh, they were great to work with, and uh, pretty much said, "Okay, go write the book." And they didn't—they weren't like hanging over my uh, shoulder and telling me how to write it. They—they they just let me kind of write how I wanted to. And from the get-go, I knew that I wanted to share the stories of the people behind the mission because even though these are 
unmanned spacecraft, there are still a lot of people involved. That's right. And be behind every robot is a lot of human effort, and I wanted to tell the stories of that human effort. Yeah, well, it was it was really enjoyable, and uh, you all can enjoy it. So uh, we want to thank Nancy for joining us and for writing her book, Incredible Stories from Space. And Anne, you can enjoy all these pictures all in one place. <laughs> versus versus trying to go through all of NASA's pages with, which, with the lots of links at the end to the places you that's can right more that's more. right and, and that is the the one benefit with the ebook is you can link directly mm -hmm. right but yes right. recommended for further reading is yep and my and my favorite space books too are at the end there too mm -hmm. so yeah it was oh, fun yeah. fun to be able to share all of that it's excellent excellent all well, right, thank Nancy, you. thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to our viewers for tuning in. And, uh, well, Nancy, I'll see you around on Twitter. Sounds good. I'll, we'll keep in touch, that's for sure. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.